Uh, so today uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Alex Gaeta from Colombia. Uh, he's an expert and a pioneer in many uh, subfields of optics in uh, ultra fast uh, nonlinear optics, uh, nanophotonics. And uh, he's, of course, very well known and had many pioneering effects, uh, the, uh, works in particular. Uh, he was awarded the Towns Medal. Uh, award uh, last year or two years ago now, because now we're in 2021. That was 2019, right? Um, and uh, I have to say, I, I have uh, uh, been very uh, inspired by some of his works, uh, both myself and, and Sunil. We have read uh, many of uh, Alex's uh, and, and his group's papers, uh, in particular in, in frequency comb and on chip uh, generation of. Uh, light on, on on chip devices, so I'm uh, looking forward to his talk. And thanks a lot again for accepting to giving a virtual talk at JQA, Alex. Thanks, Mohaba. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks to Charles, Alicia, for the invitation to to come speak. Um, so let me share my screen here. Okay. PowerPoint doesn't have a green laser pointer yet, so uh, I'm sure they're working on that. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about is uh, quantum photonics in the frequency domain. Uh, and hopefully, uh, while many of the concepts are, I'm sure, are familiar to this group, uh, and, and certainly, uh, what, hopefully, what uh, I'll be able to tell you about are some ideas that, that may be a little bit different from how we, we normally think about uh, doing quantum photonics, which uh, certainly um, you know, many pioneers are, are here in the audience. Um, let's see here. Uh, for some reason, it's not letting me uh, advance. Huh. Okay, there we go. So here, I'll just, you know, uh, again, it's always good when you start off a talk to, to really start and tell something that everyone in the audience knows. So this is something that, that hopefully everyone's very familiar with. But, you know, one of the really arguably maybe the most fundamental aspect of quantum uh, mechanics, quantum photonics, quantum, uh, quantum information processing is the idea of entanglement. And in photonics, we can do this in, a, in an incredibly easy way. We, we, all we need is, is a single photon and a beam splitter. You take this uh, single photon, and let's assume it's a 50-50 beam splitter here. The photon has a 50% probability of going in this arm or in this arm. And so if you actually write the state of the, the system here, it's just a superposition state. And this represents this entangled state where there's a probability that it could be in one arm and not in the other or in the other arm and not in the, the former. And so this is really kind of a fundamental aspect of, of quantum photonics. And many of the types of information processing that is currently being done is based on kind of this very simple entanglement. Of course, you know, the idea is to get perhaps much more complicated uh, forms of entanglement, but certainly this is the, the basic one. And certainly the idea of doing this in the spatial domain as I've shown here, and that's why I want to distinguish this in the spatial domain, uh, it's pretty straightforward. And certainly if you want to take this and you want to put this on a chip, uh, it's possible to put you know, beam splitters or wave couplers on a chip and do this in a very easy way on a chip. And, and, but there are other, of course, domains where you can do entanglement. You can do polarization entanglement. Uh, you can do temporal entanglement and so on. And what I'm going to be talking about here is really doing this type of quantum entanglement and quantum information processing but in the uh, frequency domain. And so it's a little bit different from perhaps what some of you have seen before. And so what I thought I'd do is just start off and tell you kind of in advance, and I haven't explained anything yet, but it's just giving you an idea of how one might do uh, quantum processing in the frequency domain. This is not something, you, you need some nonlinear process. And it, of course you could do this perhaps with a modulator, but it turns out you can do this very well with nonlinear photonics. And the type of frequency processing or the frequency beam splitter uh, that we'll create is one based on nonlinear photonics. And it consists of a, a third order nonlinear medium. 
and by a third order nonlinear median, this means almost any material you can think of. Uh, I mean, even vacuum has a third order nonlinearity. Uh, but in this case, uh, the third order nonlinearity that we're interested in is developing is, for example, in waveguides and so on. And all materials, even amorphous materials, have a chi three nonlinearity. We then pump this medium with two pump waves. And here I indicate them by red and yellow. And then this forms our frequency beam splitter. So this right here, that's our device. And what we rely on is a process uh, known as four wave mixing. And what it consists of is uh, an interaction of a single, for example, if we now repeat this uh, type of entanglement experiment, we're bringing a single photon and it's gonna interact with these two pump waves. And the nonlinear process that we're interested in is the one that I'm showing here. And here I'm kind of showing it at the single photon level where we annihilate one pump photon. We annihilate the single photon coming in. We actually create a pump photon. And then we create this fourth frequency at omega three, if you want to call this the idler photon. But it turns out the efficiency of this process, we can adjust by just adjusting the powers or the intensities of these two pump waves. And so what we do is we adjust them so that in fact, the probability of energy transfer from this photon, the blue to the green is actually 50%. And under those conditions, we don't know what frequency or what color the photon will come out. It could come out as a blue photon or as a green photon. But if we write the state of that system, it looks just like our ordinary spatial beam splitter uh, scenario where the photon can come out in the green or not in the blue or can come out in the blue, not in the green. And so this forms our form of entanglement that is the basis for a lot of our studies. Now, I will say that this is process here is also a form of what's called quantum frequency conversion. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Whereas many uh, researchers uh, in our group included are always interested in trying to maximize uh, that's quantum frequency conversion from the blue, let's say to the green. And certainly, uh, you know, there's uh, great work being done at NIST, for example, in Kartik's group, uh, where they're you know, doing this type of quantum frequency conversion. Um, but it turns out there's a very interesting regime is precisely the one I've shown here where you don't do hundred, you don't have to do necessarily hundred percent frequency conversion. You operate in the regime where the conversion efficiency is 50%. And then what you get is this type of beam splitter operation. So I just wanted to show, take uh, an example of kind of where nonlinear photonics and this type of entanglements uh, in the spatial domain is currently being used. So here's a paper from a uh, recent paper on trying to build a photonic chip quantum computer. This is work done by the uh, Bristol group, uh, Jeremy O'Brien and Mark Thompson. And so I don't wanna to go too much into the details here, but you know we have a pump wave that comes in, gets split, and then you see all these spirals here. And these spirals are where, where photons are actually getting generated, parallel photons, red and blue photons are getting generated. And they actually, this process in which they're being generated here in this part of the chip, is actually also a four wave mixing process, but it's different from the one I just told you about. In this case, they just have a single pump wave that comes into our chi three medium. And you know how they, how they favor this process? Well, they do this through a phase matching process, which uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit, but it has a different phase matching process. And under these conditions, you annihilate two pump photons and you create a signal either photon. And the beauty of this is these are created in pairs. And so there's a, if I detect a signal photon here, that means there's an idler photon with 100% certainty that's been generated as well. And so then what you can do, for example, is detect the signal photon, and then you know that at this particular color and this particular time or an orientation in space, for example, I've generated a red photon with 100% uncertainty. Now this process, this forward mixing process, although it looks like I'm mixing red and blue, and blue photons, does not do the quantum frequency conversion. And, and this is really a process that is, is, it's like an amplifier, parametric amplifier. And so as a result, uh, this process creates these other photons in pairs, but can't be used to do this type of quantum frequency conversion I just told you about. So the interesting part is this one all the way to the right. This is where they do all the entanglement. And so once they've generated their photons and they know they've generated them, they then combine them in the entanglement uh, all the way over here. And so this is all done in the spatial domain. Now here, I don't know, I have maybe, it uh, looks like some, you know, of the order of 16 photons. But to really be useful for a photonic quantum computer, 
you probably have to get in the uh, of the order of a million. And, uh, and it turns out that's not so easy to do, even in the spatial domain, even using chips, uh, trying to scale up this type of quantum computer in the spatial domain is not so straightforward. There are losses uh, which really kill you. Uh, and even the losses, even though these circuits can be made pretty you know, loss-free, they're still relatively lossly. And as you're scaling up to many, many uh, uh, components, uh, what you'll find is currently right now, the losses are way too high in order to do this. And so this is what's motivated us is to try to find a different domain in which to do this type of quantum information processing and instead work in the frequency domain. The beauty of the frequency, working in the frequency domain is your losses don't necessarily scale up in size. I can keep adding frequencies to my system, but all the components, all the waveguides, as long as they're designed right, can continue to operate in this frequency domain. And so this may allow you to beat the scaling and overcome the scaling issues that occur for uh, different types of uh, quantum information processing in the spatial domain and, for example, in the time domain. So there's been a, a number of you know, uh, papers and researchers in the recent year, not very nice demonstrations of, of, of frequency domain quantum processing and actually trying to explore this possibility of using this additional degree of freedom. And uh, what I'm going to be focusing on for my talk today are, are our efforts on frequency domain quantum processing. And this includes Ramsey interference with single photons, frequency domain Hong Mandel interference, which as you can imagine is a kind of fundamental type of uh, two photon interference that, uh, that's uh, kind of innate to true uh, quantum systems. And then I'll talk about how we exploit this to do uh, frequency multiplexing. At the end of my talk, I'll, I'll also add on a couple of interesting uh, aspects of, of using this type of quantum frequency conversion to do uh, different types of uh, quantum information processing. And I'll, I'll leave that at the end. So again, as I mentioned earlier, this is really what I'm talking about here is a certain type of quantum frequency conversion. We have some quantum state, for example, and we convert it to a different color. That's the bottom line. And again, as I mentioned, you know, Cartex Group is doing a lot of work in this area in the, with using photonics. And, and a lot of the motivation is, for example, uh, to try to connect quantum memories to telecom wavelengths. So you have Maybe you want to transport these over reasonably long distances. So you want to transport at 1550, but it turns out a lot of the quantum memories, whether it's atoms or in diamond NV centers or other solid state systems, uh, that they're working in the near infrared. And so how you connect the two, you want to do quantum frequency conversion. An extreme version of quantum frequency conversion, which also is known as quantum transduction, is to actually interface microwave photons to telecom. Okay, so that's another type. And then, for example, more pragmatic, practical is, you know, if you have mid-infrared photons and you want, you know, that's, there's not a lot of single photon detectors available in that wavelength range. And so if you want to convert them uh, efficiently to uh, um, photons that can be detected with uh, single photon detectors, this might be one way to do this. Now, all these processes rely on two kind of key parts. One is you want to operate as close as possible to unity efficiency. Okay, and this is really challenging. So we have a nonlinear process here that we're trying to do. And, you know, it, it, really the community has been happy to demonstrate nonlinear optical processes, but actually pushing it to the limits where it can really operate what, in the limits where theory says that you can get perfect efficiency, that's not so easy to do. And then the second part is it cannot add any noise. So you want this to operate in a regime where it's ultra low noise. There's no additional photons that are added. Any of those will destroy the fidelity of the conver conversion process. So Alex? Yes. Sorry, this is Alicia. I have yes. a question. So, so, so I'm, just, I'm wondering if you're trying to do a 50% conversion, then how do I think of unit efficiency or what would be like non-unit efficiency if you're doing 50% conversion, I guess? I'm not uh, so... Well, what I would say is, I mean, that's a good point. If, if for some reason your laser just couldn't, you know, typically if you looked at uh, how it scales, it scales as the product, the power time to, times the length. And, um, and so maybe you can't achieve the power and length you want to get to unity efficiency, but you can to get 50% efficiency and, and that might be okay. But what I'll say is in general is that if you have a system where you can get to unit efficiency, you can definitely get the 50% efficiency with really good control, 
Uh, and so, you know, from that point of view, uh, you're right. Maybe it's not necessary 50% efficiency, but usually it's an indication of how good your system. And if, if you can't get to 100% efficiency, then maybe, you know, you're kind of already at the limits where maybe the system is not behaving well. You might have other nonlinear processes entering in that are corrupting it. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's really, to me, it's just an indicator that if you can get to a unit efficiency, you probably can easily operate this 50% efficiency regime. Uh- this is Alan Migdal. I got a question related to that. So uh, even at 50-50, it's probably both of them are less than 50. Is that correct? Because you have to include like losses overall. Exactly. So that's a, that's a, so I was going to add that thought. So that's a, actually a very good point is that there is, you know, uh, even when you say you're at 50%, it's probably more like uh, you know, and this would be even really good is if it's a 49, 49, in other words, there are other, always some deleterious processes that can diminish it where it's not like you get the 51, 49, it's typically you're at 49, 49. And so where has that 2% gone? Well, it's gone to some maybe nonlinear optical process. Maybe your system has some Raman scattering that's hurting you. So that's a, you know, Alan's point's a very good one. It's exactly kind of uh, telling you that if you're at, if you can get close to 100% efficiency, probably when you get to, f- to the point where you want to be at 50-50, you're probably pretty close to, and you're not at this 49-49 or, or worse. Yes, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. So, you know, there's been a lot of work done on this, uh, what I call quantum frequency conversion or frequency translation. You know, the early proposal, as far as I know, in, in using nonlinear optics was using a second order nonlinear optical material. And this was proposed by Prem Kumar's group. There was a demonstration, not great results, but demonstrating that it could work. And, and since then, there have been some impressive demonstrations of this. Uh, in the Chi-3 four-wave mixing, there's been quite a lot of work that's been done in this area. And certainly, as I mentioned, uh, Cartex work uh, using silicon nitride micro resonators stands out uh, in this respect. Um, but a key part, actually, uh, much of this early work, uh, it was it's really challenging to get to this kind of unit, unit efficiency and, and re- very high efficiencies and combination of low noise. So there were some demonstrations, for example, that got what appeared to be close to 100% efficiency, but they're quite noisy. And so this is uh, something that we've worked hard to do is to try to overcome that. So just to show you, this was uh, kind of Prem Kumar's er- early demonstration. This is using a Chi-2 medium where you come in uh, with a signal wave, blue wave, and then you, you have the pumping and you're pumping a Chi-2 material. So here's this second order nonlinear process. You're annihilating a signal photon and then you're creating a pump photon and then this other photon. And again, the relationship between, you assume this is very strong, the pump. And so the relationship between the signal and idler under those conditions is this beam splitter or unitary transformation where it's just not an amplifier. It's really cosines and sines here. And so as a result, uh, you know, if you can, this, this theta nonlinear here is proportional to the power. It's proportional to the length of, the, of, of your interaction. And so if that theta nonlinear can be at pi over two, then essentially the idler wave is just equal in some sense to the signal wave. And it, it, you've gotten in this regime of perfect conversion. And of course, if theta nonlinear is pi over four, then you're operating in this beam splitter op- mode. But of course, under those conditions, the signal and idler are very, very different in frequency typically. And so again, if you're scaling this or you wanna put this all on a chip, it's not easy to get widely different wavelengths uh, on the chip. And of course, this type of Chi-2 nonlinear process, it can only occur in, in certain classes of crystal that lack inversion symmetry like lithium niobate. And where there's been a lot of work in that area, it's certainly not nearly as developed in terms of chip base as the Chi-3. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're going to do this in the Chi-3, and this is what I showed at the beginning of my talk here, where we're going to use this four-wave mixing interaction, where now you need two pump waves to do this. So there's an additional complication here, but the beauty is, is almost any nonlinear, any material you can think of will have a Chi-3 nonlinearity. And again, the relationship between the signal and idler wave, and you can see here in terms of the length of the arrows, that now the signal and idler are, can be pretty close to each other in length or in frequency. And, but it turns out the relationship is, is identical to the one that you had from the second order nonlinearity. It's just a beam splitter type of tr- unitary transformation. And so as a result, uh, you know, we can do this 
quantum frequency conversion. And again, the advantages of using the four wave mixing here that I show you, or this Chi 3, all the wavelengths can be similar. You can almost use any material like silicon nitride or silicon. Uh, and so that potentially could scale, you know, be put in a CMOS compatible platform. And, and then this is a subtle point here, but I think in general, and I, you know, you could argue this a little bit, but I think in general, these four wave mixing processes can be made to operate over much larger wavelength range uh, than the Chi 2 versions. And so if you want to operate over many, many different frequencies, uh, it's a little bit easier, I think, to do this in the Chi 3 limit. So just to give you intuition, because uh, you know this is you know can be described by a classical four-wave mixing process, and so what I like to do is just show this picture here, uh, because there is kind of an analogy to uh, work that's that's been done with, for example, modulators, where you use a grading of some sort. You know, you you use a modulator to do this frequency conversion. It's a very narrow frequency range, but you could do that. And here you can think of is that this is also kind of a modulation that's occurring. In this case, we have a material which has a chi-3 nonlinearity, and you can think of this as just having an index of refraction that depends locally on intensity. So if I take two pump waves here of different frequencies, they'll in constructively interfere where they do the index of refraction is a little bit higher, where they destructively interfere, it's a little bit lower. And because they're at different frequencies, this creates a grating that's actually moving inside the material. So if this is an optical fiber or a waveguide, this is what it actually looks like. And so now my signal, and this could be my single photon signal comes in, it sees this grating, it scatters off that grating and transfers its energy to the idler. So in this way, you can think of this nonlinear process here is really kind of like scattering off a classical grating. And again, it depends on this nonlinear strength here, which goes like the power of these two pump waves and the length of the interaction. And so of course, for many of the things we're doing, if we're a beam splitter, we wanna operate in this regime right here where we're at 50-50. But of course you can get in the regime, this is a cosine squared dependence. And so you can get in the regime, this would be where you want perfect conversion. So how do we do this? So everything I've told you about so far says that, you know, you have energy conservation at, at the photon level. You know, I'm annihilating a signal in the pump photon, creating another pump and an idler. And this process has to occur uh, for energy conservation reasons. But we also need to have momentum conservation. That is, we need to match the propagation constants in precisely this manner here. And so that process is called phase matching for, for nonlinear optics here. And it just means, again, just echoing this picture here, the propagation constants have to add up to that of these two over here. And that's not trivial to do, but it turns out just to give you a kind of intuition, it turns out for a process that I'm showing here where the pumps are on the short wavelength side, and I'll explain why we do this. I'm sorry, uh, let me make sure I get this right. It's actually the opposite, but uh, we won't do it. But assuming the pumps are reasonably close to each other on this side, and then the signal the idler will be on this side over here. What you want in order to get this phase matching to work out is that the group velocity dispersion should be zero right between the two. So the frequency difference here is gonna be equal to the frequency difference here. And then you want to design your system so that the group velocity dispersion actually goes to zero. So there's two platforms that we've worked with in, in, uh, in my group here. Um, we've worked a lot with optical fiber. It's great because it has very low noise. Uh, I'm sorry, very low loss. But one of the real problems with working with optical fiber is it has Raman scatter and the Raman scattering is comparable to the Chi-3 and this is a real issue. Uh, and, but I'll tell you how we overcome that. And of course, currently what we're working on is trying to do this in, uh, uh, on a chip-based platform. We've been working on this and, and as I mentioned, Cartex Group has also been doing a lot of great work on this. But um, you know, this is something we hope to do so that we no longer have to use optical fiber and we can do everything in here. And so, although this is a subtle point, you know, silicon nitride in particular can now, we can go almost meter long distances on a chip. These are sp meter long spirals that are on a chip. The, the losses in silicon nitride, you know, in Michal's group, Michal Lipson's group, who I, we collaborate with, you know, uh, effectively we can create micro resonators here so they have Qs approaching 10, 60 million. And so these are the highest Q in planar platform that has been demonstrated. And a key part, although this, there's, 
certainly members of my community who, who disagree with me on this, but uh, all I'll say is in all the quantum experiments we've ever done, we see no evidence of Raman noise having any influence on any of the uh, type of experiments that we're doing here. And again, silicon nitride, there's no two photon absorption. And the key part here, which is a big advantage over optical fiber, and this is this part where we have to always design the zero group velocity dispersion to be in a certain location. Well, we can do this type of dispersion engineering. It's something that we've pioneered in these planar platforms. And so we really know how to do this very well and, and phase match it, and we can do it across a wide range of wavelengths. So although these are things we're working on, I'm gonna tell you all the results I'll be telling you about today were work that was done in optical fiber. So what's the problem with working with optical fiber? So one thing, the first thing to do is uh, we have Raman scattering. And Raman scattering typically is gonna take you from high frequency to low frequency. So there's gain for the, and so you produce a lot of photons uh, where the, the Raman peaks in, in glass. And it turns out in glass, it's very broad. So it's very hard to avoid. So the first thing we do is say, well, what we'll do is we'll put the signal idler on the anti-stoke side, because if we're on the stoke side, that's where there's a lot of gain and a lot of Raman photons. So we put them there. So we have our pump waves near 1550. And then we say, we're gonna put the signal idler wave very far away, as far away as we can to avoid Raman. The problem is that room temperature, there's still a lot of Raman noise. So here, this red line is kind of an indicative of how, how, many, how, many, pump how many pump photons are getting scattered through this Raman effect into this regime. And it's still way too high. In fact, this is in all the early experiments that we're doing forward mixing, like Mike Raymer's group and, and other groups, this is what they ran into. Uh, but it turns out uh, that when you are on the anti-stoke side, the amount of anti-stokes photons you get is very sensitive to temperature. And so what my postdoc said, well, let's just put the fiber uh, into uh, <coughs> a doer of nitrogen and you just put it into a doer. And sh sure enough, you take this line here and uh, you bring it down to this point here. Uh, to the point where that there's essentially, we, we detect, I don't know, maybe once out of every 100 events, we actually see an anti-Stokes photon. And so it really basically solves the problem. So the fiber, it's about 100 meters long, gets dumped into a doer of liquid nitrogen, and we just get rid of all those Raman photons. Another key part here, which is a subtle part, is you say, well, there, there could be other forward mixing processes. So what we do is, again, we're operating in the regime where the pump waves are actually in the normal dispersion regime. And by operating in the normal dispersion regime, you don't have this gain modulational instability. So the, the kind of purple here represents that parametric noise. And again, it's very far from the signal idler, so it doesn't contribute. So here was the experiment to set up rag scattering forward mixing. So we have two pumps here. Uh, we combine them together. We send them inside this nonlinear fiber. This is something you can purchase. It's kind of off the shelf. And then we generate our single photons. We have them interact. And then we look at the properties of the photons that are actually generated here using a, um, a single photon uh, detector. So here I just show uh, kind of the effect of cooling the fiber. So at 300 degrees, we have quite a lot of counts uh, that show up because of the anti-Stokes, the Raman. But once you cool down to kind of the 77 degree level, it's pretty much disappeared. Roughly once every uh, thousand events, we actually see a Raman noise photon show up. So this is a really good sign and uh, this enables our experiments. So we did a couple experiments. The first you do the easy one, which is you attenuate a classical beam until you know a pulse, you create a classical pulse until it's of the order of a single photon on average. And so here I show where we have the pumps are pulsed. And so we're turning them on and off in a very well-controlled way. They're a few nanoseconds long. And what you see here is a conversion from these pumps. Uh, and here you can see that the uh, signal gets almost perfectly attenuated here. The idler gets created and you know we can measure that. And it turns out that with classical pump pulses where we can match very well the band with our, our four wave mixing interaction, we essentially get in the limit of 99% conversion efficiency. So it's nearly perfect. Uh, with single photons, it's a little bit harder because uh, the bandwidth of the photons is a little bit broader. And so we don't get quite perfect efficiency. But here I show an example where we can get 93. And typically, actually, in experiments I'll be telling you about, we're operating in kind of 95% conversion efficiency, which, uh, to my knowledge, are the highest conversion efficiencies that have been um, produced to date uh, in the system. <clears throat> 
And so here, just to show that the quality of the photons that are converted is really good. Uh, the blue represents the G2 measurement. Uh, and you can see it's pretty down, almost down to zero, as you might expect for the single photons. But what you can see is the converted idler photons also are approximately zero as well. And so this indicates here that we uh, you know, can really do this very well and we maintain the fidelity of the quantum state or at least the single photons in our system. So then the next step to do when we when we show these experiments with what everyone says, oh, oh yeah, but you know, how, how good really are the quality of the photons? And so one way, and, and certainly the community has always done this, is you do a Hong Mandel interference. And this gives you an idea, of, it tells you a lot about the features of it. But now we're doing Hong Mandel in the frequency domain, which as I'll show you is very interesting. So just to uh, remind you how this Hong Mandel effect, it's a, it's a two photon interference effect. And it works in the following way. This was actually first done in, in Len Mandel's group at Rochester. I was actually a graduate student there at the time. I remember when, the, when Jeff Wu and, uh, and his postdoc Hong were doing these experiments. And it's really just a very fundamental, beautiful effect. Uh, you can still, if you try to tell your parents about this, uh, it still seems unbelievable when you're trying to explain it to them because uh, even though it's so simple. But the idea in, in, in these experiments was the following is we actually have a spatial beam splitter here. We bring in two photons that are identical and there's four possible outcomes for your system. One is that this one is reflected, this is transmitted. So both photons end up in this arm. Uh, it could be that both photons are transmitted, and so you have one and one. It could be that both are reflected, and then you also end up with one and one. Or maybe you end up with this one being reflected, this one being transmitted, so you end up with two photons down here. And it turns out if you time these photons right, and these are high quality photons, and you have a good beam splitter here, it turns out that under those conditions, actually you have destructive interference between the two one-on-ones. And the end result is you only get two photons out here or two photons out here. And so the state of the system after starting out with two photons is the following entangled state. And so this is really, again, it's remarkable. I still, you know, I know I can do the math and I know it works out, but, you know, in terms of offering intuition as to why this, you know, just works out so beautifully uh, and why this happens that you only get two and two, two or two. Uh, is a remarkable. And so you get what's known as the Hong Mandel dip. So when you time these photons so that they're actually coincident, you find that the probability of getting coincident counts here, that is one photon here, one photon here goes to zero. And so this is telling you something about the, uh, really the um, quality of your whole setup here. It's telling you something about the beam splitter, the photons and everything. And if, as, if this can get very close down to zero, this means you have a very uh, good quality quantum high fidelity system. So I was always kind of under the impression that you had to start off with two identical photons, but it turns out, and I'll try to emphasize this part about Hong Mandel or this two photon interference. It's not that the input photons have to be identical. It's that the output photons do. Okay, so this is a key part here. That's where you get the interference. And so now imagine I have my Bragg scattering forward mixing here, my frequency beam splitter. And now I have a blue photon that comes in and a red photon that comes in. So the four possible outcomes are that I can have two blue photons, a red and a blue photon, another possibility of another red and a blue photon, or two red photons. And sure enough, the math is the same. I mean, of course, this is a, you know, the unitary transformation, everything's the same. And so these two destructively interfere. After passing through your system, you never get a red and a blue photon. You can only get either both photons come out blue or both photons come out red. They never come one of each. And so this is trying to re illustrate this aspect of Hong Mandel interference. You don't have to start off with two identical photons. These are red and blue. And the, but the possibility is you only get blue or red out. You don't get one of each. So here, in order to do this experiment, we set it up in a, what I think is a very nice way. This is work that was led by my grad student, uh, Chitali Yoshi. And what she did was she actually generated photon pairs here in a silicon nitride microresonator. And, uh, and so how does this work? Uh, it's a very elegant way. And again, Cartex Group works on this, you know, uh, and has done a lot of nice demonstrations of this. The idea here is you pump one of these modes here, and then you create signal and idler pairs uh, to, that come out together. And the beauty of the system of using this microresonator, and that's why these microresonators are ideal for these kind of quantum domain, frequency domain uh, experiments, is that it, it generates the photons on a grid. 
And so this is just perfect for frequency domain. So uh, these photons are correlated. These pair are correlated. The ones out here are correlated, but there's no correlations amongst themselves. And so these are really kind of independent quantities here. And so the idea here is I can generate them on a grid and I just can pick and choose which ones I want. They're gonna be correlated photon pairs that go. And actually we, we, we published a paper early on, very nice paper showing that these photons can be very narrow band down to a few megahertz, 10 megahertz wide. Uh, so here's a paper that we, we actually did over five years ago. And unfortunately for a number of reasons, never got published. It's highly cited on the archive, but unfortunately it was never published. But it showed that you could get very narrow band photons using this approach. And so using that, we actually, so oh, uh, let me go back up to the setup. So what we, the idea here is we generate the correlated photons. We then mix them with our two pump waves here. We do our Bragg scattering forward mixing inside the fiber. And then we do, uh, you know, we separate the, the photons at the output here. And we try to determine, you know, in fact, do we get this type of hongo mandel interference? Now, unlike the case where it's normally done kind of in the, what I would say in the ultra fast regime, we actually, these are narrow band photons. We actually can time resolve them. And so this allows us to, and these are narrow band photons, which is very different from the typical regime is since we're temporarily resolving them. So what you see here is uh, the other thing, oh, let me make one last point, is we can tune the frequencies here and they don't necessarily have to line up with this grid at which the photons are generated. So they're generated on this grid, but of course, as we detune these from that grid, then you can expect that these photons will not be completely converted. And it turns out under those conditions, if you go through all the math, what you find is that the second order correlation you get here depends on two quantities. One is this exponential quantity, and this has to do with uh, the shape, the line width of your um, uh, of the photons, you know, that they're, they're Lorentzian line shape because our microresonator. But then there's this sine squared dependence here which has to do with the fact that the pumps don't have to line up with the grid that our photons are being generated. And it turns out this is entirely analogous to an atomic system work that was done by uh, Jörg Rempe's group showing this type of quantum beating. And so this is, if you go through all the math, this is the formula. But the key part here to, to, to note is if the pumps are tuned to the frequency difference at which the photons are being generated, then this part goes away. And what you'll get is you should get completely zero across your entire thing because we're time resolving these photons. And sure enough, what you see here when everything is well controlled here, this is the hongu mandel interference. This is the probability of detecting a red and a blue photon. It's completely zero. And then of course, as you begin detuning the pump, what you begin seeing here is the effect of the sine squared that shows up here. And you begin seeing these oscillations. And you can see that we actually get in regime. And of course, in the regime where we're way off, then it's just like our thermal source, which is like each of the individual photons would be. So again, a very nice example of, of showing this type of frequency domain hongo mandel interference. So the last part, at least of this part here, I'm just checking how I'm doing on time, good. So uh, we'll, we'll show how we, you know, we can do Ramsey interference with this system. So just to remind you uh, how Ramsey interference works, this was, you know, very powerful technique that's, that's used in spectroscopy, but also used in many other, types of uh, you know, clock systems, atomic clock systems, and so on, is you have some two state system, uh, ground state, excited state here, uh, and you come in with what's called a pi over two pulse. This pi over two pulse puts you in a linear superposition of the ground and excited state. And then during this period, when it's in the superposition, a system can actually evolve and it might undergo free induction decay or, or, or it might actually go some regular decay, but it turns out that if I then hit it with another pi over two pulse, now normally if nothing happened in this regime here, then the system would just completely be in the excited state. And so by detecting uh, if the system is in an excited state or ground state, what you should find is that um, you can get some measure of what actually happened in this intermediate regime here. And so a number of things. One, if you've undergone free induction decay, depending on the time uh, that you see, look for the delay here, but depending on this time here, which the system has evolved, you get what are called this kind of sinusoidal dependence here. These are known as the Ramsey fringes. And of course, uh, if you do have decay here, then what you'll find is the modulation of these Ramsey fringes uh, goes down. And so this can give you a lot of information. And this is this powerful type of 
uh, interferometry that occurs with a two-state system. Well, we can do the same thing uh, in, our, in our frequency system, our frequency two-bit system here. We have this frequency qubit here, where, for example, the idler photon can be the ground state. Or, I'm sorry, the signal photon would be our ground state. The idler is our excited state. And of course, now we have coupling between the signal and the idler. And so if we were to be in a superposition of our ground and excited state, that's the same of operating as a 50-50 beam splitter here. What's interesting about our system, there's no natural decoherence. There's no decay from the excited to the ground state. You know, the two just travel together through there. They, of course, both can get absorbed, but there's not the decoherence that occurs in these atomic systems. An interesting part that we are pursuing and we're, we're investigating is the fact that this frequency difference, of course, can be made to couple to optomechanical systems. And so there could be a very interesting interactions and uh, of coupling here uh, where you can take a, another two-state quantum system and couple it to a photonic two-state system uh, in just this way. And so the idea here is by seeing how the system evolves and looking if I have red or blue photons at the output here, we can get some idea of what happened in this intermediate regime, just like uh, for our four-way mixing system. So our pi over two pulse is gonna be 50% conversion. And then by just propagating in free space, they both have different propagation constants. So that's just kind of like this free induction decay that you have in an atomic system. So here's the experiment. Uh, again, we have our nonlinear fiber here. We have two pump waves that are sitting up here, and then we bring in our single photons. In this case, our Ramsey interferometer is just taking the output from the fiber, propagating to a mirror here. And what we do in this case is we have the pump waves that come in and then come back into the fiber. So our pi over two pulse is in one direction, and then our second pi over two pulse is in the opposite direction. The signal in either wave then propagate and bounce off a mirror. And because of this, uh, you know, they, they undergo different phase shifts because they're at different wavelengths, different frequencies. And so by changing the delay of the mirror here, this is like changing the free induction decay in our system and allows us to do this kind of experiment. And so then here at the output, all we do is detect uh, the, how much of a blue and how much of the red we have coming in the system. And so sure enough, we did this for a weak coherent state. We see we get these Ramsey fringes here, but we see that even when we go down to the single photon level, and again, we, we at this for these experiments, we didn't have the conversion efficiency that we have currently today, uh, but still you can see clearly these Ramsey interference fringes, even for single photons here. So this <coughs> represented a nice demonstration of the single photon Ramsey interference uh, in the frequency domain. So the last part I'll tell you about here is this frequency multiplexing. And I will say in this case here, we do want to operate in the limit as the highest possible conversion efficiency, as close to unity as possible. And so what we're motivated here is to, is to try to develop a near deterministic source. So again, you know, our ideal one is, is that you can have single photons on demand. You push a button, you trigger a signal, and you get a single photon on demand. And the idea is that they are deterministic, they're indistinguishable. Uh, you always have just a single photon, not two photons, and you can, you can do this at very high rates, so it has very high brightness. So there's really kind of two approaches that you know people have looked at, which is the quantum dots, where there's been a lot of great work done there, especially in the last few years. And then there have also been a, a lot of work using parametric single photon sources. Um, in this case, you have a chi-2 medium here, for example. You come in with a pump, and as I showed earlier, you generate single photon pairs, and you can do the same thing in a chi-3 medium, as I mentioned. The beauty of this, unlike the quantum dots, is this system operates at room temperature. It certainly can be really readily integrated in a photonic chip device. So if you want to, you know, as I showed you at the very beginning, and Jeremy O'Brien, the group at Bristol, and PsiQ, you know, they're doing this on very large scales. Uh, it allows for a wide range of materials and potential for CMOS integration. The problem is, is when these photons come out is probabilistic. Okay, so we, we know uh, when you detect one, you know that there's another one there, but you have to wait. And so it's this pro pro probabilistic nature, which really is a limitation for the system. And if you try to turn up the pump to make it more deterministic, then the probability is that you're going to get two photons and not always just one. And so you're limited here on how bright you can make it and how deterministic you can make it. And certainly, you know, uh, as, as, I, as, I, as I saw here, Alan Migdal proposed this, you know, very beautiful idea, which is, well, just take these single photon sources here and uh, multiplex them together. Okay, so currently, you know, about the best you can do to avoid multi-photon processes with a single 
case is about 25%. This is kind of your, your maximum heralding efficiency and you want to get close to 100%. And so the idea is very is you just have a whole bunch of these different probabilistic sources operating in parallel. And then what you do is you implement a switching network. That is, I keep waiting at each point for a signal photon to get generated. When I do, I then uh, know that I have a photon entered into my system and I spit out my photon. I then have the switching network, which immediately turns off my pump. And then I know uh, that uh, I can produce uh, a single photon. And it turns out if you have enough of these, uh, you can do this with near, you know, get close to this unity efficiency. And it turns out, you know, for kind of typical lossless, you have to be up around 17, maybe higher. This is pretty optimistic, but shows that you pretty much want to do this on a chip because you don't want to have 17, uh, you know, Chi 2 crystals, uh, you know, in your lab. That'll take up an entire optical table. And so there've been a number. So, you know, the obvious one is just to do the spatial multiplexing, do it in the spatial domain, as I mentioned here. The problem is as you scale up, certainly if you wanna scale up to 17 sources here, uh, losses start really hurting. As I keep saying, even though it's a chip, as it starts expanding, the losses start hurting you. You could do temporal multiplexing, which Paul Quiot's group has done some really exp uh, impressive experiments in this area where you temporally multiplex them uh, and combine them in such a way. But again, you run into a case where losses, you know, as you scale the system up, losses start hurting. And then you could maybe do some combination. But in all these cases, there's this one fundamental part that as you're scaling it up to many more, the losses start permeating your system. And it turns out you do you no longer have any gain by adding additional sources. And so what we do is, is try to do frequency multiplexing. So as I mentioned earlier, we can produce these, you know, using a micro resonator, for example, we can produce these on a grid. And the idea is I can herald all these photons here. They're all at different frequencies. But what I do is I switch them. I have a quantum frequency converter, which converts them always to the same frequency, identical frequency. And so if you could do this, the system, if I'm pumping one single fiber and doing everything, you know, in one single waveguide, as I scale up to more frequencies, I'm not increasing the losses in the system. So that's a, a real advantage of this over other systems. And if you actually look at the scaling, for example, and looking at, you know, for a typical heralding probability, how many multiplex sources you need to get to very high uh, deterministic heralding probability. What you find, of course, is that, you know, our frequency domain approach offers this probability of being, you know, has fixed losses, but it keeps scaling with the number of multiplex sources. If you look at other types of sources based on time, temporal and spatial multiplexing, what you find is you kind of reach a peak. And if you keep going up in multiplex sources, uh, you start, uh, reducing the heralding probability. So we did the experiment and I actually like to show the experiment because it's almost easier to understand. But the idea here is we have three pump waves here and we can turn each of them, some combination of them on or off very quickly. So what we did is we generated single photons. We filtered them out to know what frequency they're coming in. So the idea if it's, it comes out at this frequency here, uh, we can actually detect it. If it's a slightly different frequency, we can detect it. And if it's at this third frequency, we can detect it. And so of course, what comes out here are corresponding heralded photons all at different frequencies here, because again, the set, we have a single pump wave and they satisfy phase matching. But depending on which one is detected here, we do FPGA logic and we, do, we turn on and off the pump waves in a suitable way. So for example, if we detect uh, this photon here, that means it's a green photon. What we do is we don't turn on the pumps and the system just goes to the system. If we detect an omega-1 photon, ah, our truth table says we should turn on this pump wave and this pump wave. And so we turn those two on and we frequently shift this uh, aquamarine back to green at this point. And then if we come out and this, phot and this photon is coming out here, well, that means that this, it was due to this heralding of this. And then we're going to turn on this pump wave and pump B. Okay. And then we frequency shift from blue to the green. So no matter what, the photon is always come out, coming out in the green at this point here. So we did this experiments. We, did, we checked each of the individual ones here. And sure enough, what we find is when we uh, do our system, our frequency multiplexing, we see a, an enhancement here of about three and a half dB. Of course, it's not the five dB uh, that you might hope for if, if you have a factor of three, but it's still pretty good. And it certainly shows some real improvement here. We can get very high generation rates of the system 
operating at this re you know relatively high conversion efficiency and heralding probability. And so uh, you know again, it's a proof of principle. You'd want to scale up to many more pump ways, but in principle, that's something that could be done. And so again, what we showed is that even at the highest uh, you know kind of heralding photon rates, we get pretty good G twos in the system for our multiplex photons, indicating that you know the system is is really maintaining pretty good fidelity. So I'm just going to show you here what you know what potentially a system would look like that could be all put on chip. This would be you know to try to develop a deterministic system. You would generate these photon pairs, you know, micro resonator. You would herald these different photons. For example, the ones all these colors here. You would then combine them in a spiral silicon nitride waveguide. You have a whole bunch of pump waves here. And again, you have a logic network in terms of electronics that would be all combined with that. So you could actually produce deterministic photons in the blue. So this would be the holy grail goal for these types of experiments. So I also want to mention here that there is possibility, you know, here we focus on single photons, but, you know, for continuous variable, uh, you know, uh, quantum processing, uh, you want to work with squeeze states. So I just want to show here that we can do four wave mixing. Uh, unlike the the one that you saw, where one you know two pump photons are getting annihilated, you can have the reverse process. In other words, we come in with two pump photons, but then we generate a degenerate signal and idler photon. And so what we do here is we actually have a silicon nitride microresonator where they're pumped at two different pumps here. And what we do is we actually have what's called the squeezy state here that's getting generated here. And then in another microresonator, we operate above threshold. And it turns out that the, this allows us to do uh, heterodyne measurement because now I have a classical state here that's exactly at the same frequency as a squeezer. And we can combine them to our heterodyne detection here. And we can actually detect, in this case, 3 dB of squeezing in the system. But it's the first example I know of of doing this kind of forward mixing chip based degenerate squeezing uh, in this system. So, again, this offers a possibility of doing you know continuous variables frequency domain optics so the last part of my talk is uh, i'll just take the last few minutes here is to show that we can also do what's called temporal magnification of quantum signals and it turns out there's there could be some very interesting applications here in terms of temporal mode sorting and things like christine silverhorn's group and mike ramer's group are, are currently working on um, but the idea is based on on something called uh uh, temporal magnifiers, or um, uh, you can think of as this is uh, 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 temporal magnification, temporal compression using nonlinear optics. And, and the idea is you have some device here, which I'm calling a temporal magnifier. And imagine that I have a light field here that may have features that are 100 femtoseconds in duration. Okay. So it would be great because normally we can't measure anything on this time scale. You know, about the fastest detector you have, and certainly in the photon regime is, is tens of picoseconds long. So there's no way you can resolve this. But imagine we had a device that could actually magnify it in time so that these two pulses here look something like this. And now they're separated by 100 picoseconds. So now we can use our relatively slow detector here to actually measure the spacing between the two of these. Now, if you want to do this, there's two key parts here. There can't be any added noise. So imagine this is some complicated quantum state in the temporal domain. You don't want to add any noise and you want to do this with 100% efficiency so that if you're doing some more complicated detection here, we can actually maintain all the quantum features. So what we do is we use a concept called time space duality or space time duality. This is uh, ideas that were first proposed by Brian Kohlner and, and, and we certainly advanced in the kind of uh, about a decade ago. And again, the idea is using the fact that if you look at how light diffracts, it obeys this Fresnel equation here, which is just a diffraction equation, where you have that the amplitude, its evolution goes like the second order derivative in space. Well, it turns out that if you look in the time domain at how a pulse interacts in a dispersive medium, it obeys the equation that's completely isomorphic to diffraction. That is, it undergoes dispersion. Here, the beta two is dispersion, group velocity dispersion. And so what this means here is that all the, the ideas in terms of spatial processing that have been developed for you know, five, four or five decades ago can be done in the temporal domain using this type of uh, temporal processing here. And so this is what we're going to exploit, but in the quantum domain. And so what we do is we use four-wave mixing here. 
to create a, this chirp. And so what we do is we have uh, these two pump waves, this is our forward mixing, but now what we do in order to create the signal here, we chirp this one pump here. And it turns out by chirping that pump, that is a frequency chirp that provides a quadratic phase shift. So if I go back to this point here, uh, the key part here is in order to produce a time lens, just like the spatial lens here, I need a quadratic phase shift, but in the time domain. So a regular lens, in order to focus things and magnify them, it actually just applies a spatial shift, quadratic shift, but in the spatial domain. So we just need to do this in the time domain. And the way we do this, again, is by chirping one of the pumps in our forward mixing interaction. This frequency chirp looks like a uh, time-dependent quadratic phase shift. And so what happens is the pump one and the signal interact. And what you find is the idler looks just like the signal, but with a quadratic phase shift. And so we interact in our Bragg scattering forward mixing. We do evolution here, which looks like group velocity dispersion, just like uh, ordinary diffraction. And so this allows us to actually create a time lens where we can get a magnification of over a factor of 100. And so here I show an example where we had uh, two kind of quantum level pulses here that were separated by uh, about two and a half picoseconds. And we were able to magnify them to 390 picoseconds with a magnification factor here of 150. And again, what we find is we can do quantum detection here and actually detect these pulses kind of with single photon detectors and show that there's no added noise in the system. But this out offers a, a real possibility of doing some very interesting uh, quantum processing, like temporal mode sorting uh, in, the, in, in this domain. So just to kind of summarize here, we've been working on you know, getting closer to, to degenerating deterministically. Single photons is something we're working with. And again, is you know we can take this system, and so far we've only work, been working with one photon or two photons, but we can scale this up to more complicated beam splitters if you want. We can have three-port beam splitters, four-port beam splitters, six-port beam splitters. Not so easy to do in the spatial domain, but it can be done easily in the frequency domain. Uh, and of course, starting to look at generating Bell states and GHC states, and then uh, you know again using these time lenses, we can do a type of temporal mode sorting. Uh, that, that really uh, could be easily done that, that can't be so easily done in other systems. So I just want to acknowledge a great group of grad students and postdocs that, that have been working with me on all these projects. And in particular, I want to highlight uh, Chitali Yoshi here, who just graduated from my group uh, late last year, and she's now doing a postdoc at Caltech. And uh, thank you for your attention. All right, so the floor is open for questions. Uh, Charles here, I have a comment and a question. A uh, comment is that some of these things you've shown us today look like they would be good target for nonlinear atom optics, which is sort of a house specialty of NIST of course. 20 years ago, uh, but you know, we've moved on. Uh, the question is, is there, any, is there an N-photon hong o mendel interference or is there anything new to be found there? I mean, it looks like, looks to me like uh, non nonlinear uh, optics, or maybe moving the frequency domain as you have, would be a fruitful way of exploring that. So, yeah, com yeah. compared to what one conventionally might think about. So that's an excellent question. Certainly. Uh, you know, there are types, if you consider a single beam splitter, you can put more photons in there and you do get, you know, complicated high order multi-photon interferences. It's not as clean as like the, the two photon case where actually you get a noon state, you know, it's only two photons, but you get this noon state. And certainly perhaps there could be a way, you know, one of the things we've been exploring is there some way, because we can have a much more complicated beam splitter than you can get in the spatial domain. So that's one thing we can do where we can combine, com easily combine three, four, five different photons at different frequencies and creating these N photon type beam splitters is not so easy to do in the spatial domain or other domains. So that's one. Yeah, I was, I was explore. thinking about that. Just the, what you can do in the time domain shows a lot more flexibility. Thinking exactly. about a lot, aligning things up in the spatial domain, they're quite challenging, I think. 
Yeah, I mean, you you need some complicated grading. I mean, there are things, you know, ways of doing it, but not so easy to do. Uh, and, and it turns out, you know, one thing we can do is also change the relative phases of these uh, interactions effectively. So effectively, we can act, almost actively change the beam splitter uh, in a way that cannot be so easily done in the spatial domain. Thank you. Uh, I had a kind of a high level question about the multiplexing. Uh, you mentioned that the, the, the channels in, in, in time and versus frequency and whether in frequency one might have a more like a, a different opportunity in terms of number of channels that one can operate at. What is your estimate in terms of like the bandwidth? I assume we're not going to go to UV. Uh, yeah. And, and also like how, how many slots I can... Uh, how many slots you envision maybe in the future one can get? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. So I would say typically if you use this, uh, so maybe I'll, I'll show this picture here, you know, with a micro resonator here, this channel spacing pretty easily and you could set, you know, you want to be able to separate out the frequencies, but easily we could do, let's say, operate maybe a hundred gigahertz. And let's say in the telecom regime, that's about a nanometer. Uh, we can probably get phase matching and we've done this before, but you know, again, you'd have to do things just right. But I think we could definitely get really pretty good phase matching over, let's say hundred nanometers. Mm -hmm. So my best guess is in principle, we could do, let's say, I think hundred channels. I think th that's realistic with what has been already demonstrated. Of course, getting all the pump waves in there, hundred pump waves and of course, there are other nonlinear processes that can occur, and what you want to do is suppress those processes and only have, you know, certain processes occurring. Uh, this Bragg forward mixing process—that's another story. Uh, but I think, you know, in terms of phase matching, I, and, and again, this is why the, the chip-based systems are are so good, is you could potentially engineer them so that they do have the right uh, dispersion to phase match them properly. Thanks. Um, so I actually had a question about sort of how to how to think about decoherence in these frequency domain qubits. So um, that if I if my two states are two different frequencies, then sort of as you said, there's no natural like T1 lifetime decay, but over time and over propagation, both of the photons are sort of independently decaying. Right. Um, and so I guess. My, I had sort of two questions. So the first is, can I think of the, the difference in the decay rates of these two as something like a T1? And that does my phase information decay, you know, now as the, the population decay of each half or something like that? Like, so there's a, in a conventional system, there's a T2 equals two T1 limit. That is, is T2 now just set by the loss of the individual colors. Yeah, exactly. So that's a very good point is, you know, you, if you have a differential uh, where the, the, the absorption between the two is, uh, has, is different absorption, then you do have a, a, a decoherence that sets in there. And then the second part is the phase. I mean, typically I would say it doesn't naturally appear, but you could imagine maybe having a mirror somehow, which, uh, you know, jitters and only affects one of them or, you know, affects the phase in such a way that both of them are, are not, you know, the relative phase is not correlated. And that would be your T2 type decay that you, you, you could get in that system. So, I, I, I mean, I did say there's no natural decoherence, um, but, you know, certainly if you wanted to induce a coherence and perhaps maybe there's some effect that, you know, is that cannot be easily measured uh, where, you know, here, I, I, this would be a great system to measure this natural difference in, in absorption between the two. Of course, there are other ways to measure it that are probably a little easier, but certainly by measuring, you know, how the uh, Ramsey fringes, um, uh, the modulation depth goes down, you know, that, that would tell you something about the differential uh, absorption between the two. Mm 